Good morning, church. I'm so glad we can be together today to sing praises to the true and living God and to study his word. Your presence here is a great encouragement to me, and I hope that our time together in the word will build you up and encourage you as well. Recently, I was asked the question, what does it mean to obey the gospel? They said, Andrew, you use that phrase with some frequency. Uh, what exactly do you mean when you say that? Maybe it would be good if you explained that. And as I strive for clarity, uh, I certainly do want to explain that. And I hope that you'll give me your kind attention this morning because what I'm going to be sharing with you today is at the heart of Christianity. It is simple, but it is profound. It's beautiful because it is true, but it is challenging and it is urgent. We're talking about obeying the gospel. And if you've been reading the New Testament some, you'll come across several passages which impress upon us all the great importance, even the urgency of obeying the gospel. One of those passages is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 7 through 9, which assures us that the Lord Jesus Christ is returning to this world. And when he does, it is to give you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. There's incredible weight and warning in those words. Jesus is coming back. And if you know God, if you have obeyed the gospel, it is a wonderful time of encouragement and blessing and reward. But if you do not know God, if you have not obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it is a fearful expectation of fiery vengeance. This is about judgment. This is about hell. This is an important matter to your soul. If you keep reading, you'll come to the book of 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. And in a context where Christians are being encouraged, being encouraged because they are being persecuted, because they are suffering hardships for the sake of the faith, it says in that place that the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Again, what does this teach us here? It teaches that those who obey the gospel are the righteous. And yet, if you do not obey the gospel, then God counts you among the ungodly and the sinner. And if he returns and you are among the ungodly and the sinner, it is a time of judgment, of fearful judgment. This is important to know. What is this gospel and how do you obey this gospel? If we obey the gospel, then we know God and we believe in him. If we do not obey the gospel, it is a fearful thing to ponder the Lord's return. So how does the New Testament teach us to obey the gospel? And I want to explain that for a few moments this morning. Obey the gospel. Well, let's start with the word gospel. Number one in your notes, what is the gospel? And I appreciate Brother Tucker reading from 1 Corinthians 15. I hope that you still have your Bible open to that place. We'll be there quite a bit this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and notice that in just a moment, what is the gospel, this word that means good news? But quite succinctly, we learn from Romans 1 and verse 16 that the apostle Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Greek, or for the Jew first and also for the Greek. What's that mean? It means that no matter who you are or where you're from, where you come from or what you've done. It doesn't matter who you know. You have a sin problem. And God has one solution. The gospel. The gospel. It is the gospel that will save you from your sins. And save me from my sins. It is the gospel that transforms you from a sinner to a saint. Transforms you from that ungodly one to, to a child of God. This is wonderful that there is a gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2, as our brother read a moment ago, and why I wanted you to turn there in your Bible, 
Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I'm going to continue reading verses 3 through 5. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, and then by the Twelve. Can we appreciate that what the Apostle says is that the Gospel enables our salvation? He said it saves you. You stand in the Gospel unless you have believed in vain. Hang on to it. And then we get really what the gospel is in a nutshell. What is the message? What is the facts? What has been done to save us and to make us children of God? Highlight three things here. He said, first of all, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Second, he was buried. Third, he rose again, according to the scriptures, and he was seen. He was seen. The death of Christ for our sins, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ on the third day. This is the message that was preached to them. This is the message they received and believed. All right? Receive it, believe it, stand in it. And why are they assured that they can receive it and believe it and stand in it? Why would you trust that this has happened? Well, again, we're given two reasons here in this text. That he died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was seen by cephas and then by the 12 here is the evidence that you can believe this message it all happened according to the scriptures it was witnessed and declared by the apostles we are told that in the death burial and resurrection it happened according to god's plan according to the scriptures and we can trust that if it happened according to God's plan, it fulfilled God's purpose, which was to save us from our sins. Christ died for your sins. Christ died for my sins. That is the gospel, and we can trust it. Okay, so here's these facts of the gospel. Here is this teaching. But how do you obey that? How do you obey a teaching? How does a person obey the gospel of a death, burial, and resurrection? How do you do that? Well, what we read in Timothy and Peter, excuse me, Thessalonians and Peter, in no uncertain terms, if you do not obey the gospel, then you will be lost, you'll be judged, you'll go to hell. So we want to obey it. Yet if the gospel is death, burial, and resurrection, how can you obey that? Do you obey that literally? Are we supposed to put all this together and think that somehow I as a Christian must arrange my own crucifixion? I must arrange my own burial? And after I've arranged my crucifixion and my burial, then I'm supposed to arrange my own resurrection? That's a tall order, don't you think? That's going to be a difficult thing to do, don't you think? If we are to literally obey this gospel of a death, burial, and resurrection. So it's not that. How do we obey the gospel of death, burial, and resurrection? What does a non-Christian do to obey this gospel of death, burial, and resurrection? How does a Christian continue to obey the gospel of death, burial, and resurrection? Let's explore it. Number two in your notes. Number two, how does a non-Christian obey the gospel? How does a non-Christian obey the gospel? We said a moment ago, well, you're not going to arrange your own killing and your own crucifixion. People have been coming Christians for 2,000 years, so how do they go about it? If you want to leave your marker in 1 Corinthians 15, turn with me to Romans chapter 6, where we find the Apostle Paul thanking God that the Roman brethren had been freed from their sin. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. He said that they had been set free from sin. And now they were servants or slaves to righteousness. 
Well, we read it a moment ago. What is the power of God to salvation? It is the gospel. There's only one doctrine or teaching that can set you free from sin. It is the gospel. That is what they obeyed from the heart. But you'll notice with me that they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that form of teaching to which they had been taught. Now, maybe if you're reading along from a different version, uh, yours says that standard of teaching in the ESV, or it says that pattern of teaching in the Christian Standard Bible. Um, But most of us probably the form in the New King James, the New American Standard, and so forth. It is this Greek word tupos that actually means a model, a copy, an image. It is the mark made upon something as a result of a blow or as a result of pressure. Give an example of this. If I had a a genuine coin, you know, a little widow's mite, and I put it in some Play-Doh. And how many of you all love Play-Doh? A few of you love? Okay. But we all used to love Play-Doh. So we take that little coin and we put it in the Play-Doh, and then with a hammer, smack it, right? I can pull the genuine, the original coin out of that, and what do I have left in the Play-Doh? The form. I have the form. He said they had obeyed from the heart the form, the model, the sign of that power that delivered them from their sins. The form of the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, they had obeyed the gospel, the form of the gospel. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, they're told that they had been united in the likeness of Jesus' death. And here's another Greek word that means a figure or a representation or a resemblance. Now, what had they done that had modeled the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? What had they done so that they were in the likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? In Romans chapter 6 and a little earlier in the chapter, we see what it is that they had done. For we are taught there that baptism is the figure, the form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 2, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Again, I want to highlight our words. We just read what the gospel was in 1 Corinthians 15. And now notice how it lines up here in this form in Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. The death of Christ, he said, you died to sin. In fact, you were baptized into his death. Baptism is immersion in water, baptized into his death, buried with him through baptism into death, immersion in water, into the death. Christ is raised from the dead. We know on the third day the tomb was found empty. And so we come out out of the water or one comes up out of the water in newness of life. Summarizing what had they done? They had died to sin. They had been buried with Jesus through baptism, immersion in water, and they'd been raised to walk. And this new, this new walk, this new life, right? Newness of life. It parallels the gospel. Here's the death, burial, and resurrection, but it is the form of it. They obeyed from the heart the form of it, this teaching, this doctrine. And when they did, they were freed from sin. When they did, they were saved. That's what they were doing 2,000 years ago. And that's what a non-Christian does today to become a Christian. I was struck by, if I saw this chart before, I may have forgotten. Let me tell you where I saw this poster. Framed, hanging on a wall in a house in Tanzania. is is an elder's house. And I studied that chart and I thought, that is a good chart. So I found it on the internet and I'm showing it to you. 
because it really does depict, in fact, it even uses the word reenacted, and what a fantastic word that is to capture the sense of, I have obeyed from the heart the form of the teaching of the gospel. In this baptism, I am reenacting the gospel. I am obeying the gospel. We repent of sin. We die to sin. We are buried when we are immersed in water, just as he was buried. And by the way, I, I do want to emphasize here, when we talk about a burial, it's like Christ was buried. We are matching, right, going along with obeying the form of the gospel. I just say all that to say there's lots of different cultures that bury folks in all different kinds of ways. And some cultures don't bury folks at all. But this gospel is for all culture and for all time. And so let us learn how Jesus was buried in the earth all the way, right? Submerged, the stone rolled over it. He's covered in the ground. That's how he was buried. And this is what baptism is. It is a burial. And he came out of the ground on the third day. The tomb was found empty. We come up out of the water resurrected. There is a new life. Paul rejoiced in Romans 6 and verse 17. I thank God for it. Romans 6 and verse 17. That though you were slaves of sin, while you had your sins, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered and having been set free from your sin, you obeyed it and it set you free from your sin and you became slaves of righteousness. The gospel is reenacted in baptism of death, burial and resurrection. It's what one must do to be saved, what one must do to be saved today. And this goes right along with many New Testament teachings. For instance, as Jesus sent forth his apostles upon his resurrection to preach the gospel into all the world. In Mark 16 and verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. If you want to be saved, you need to believe and to be baptized, immersed. Why it is obeying the gospel. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, as the apostle Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, he told the crowds to repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. There's a word that means a release of guilt, a release of penalty, forgiven of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Die to sin, be baptized, that your sins be forgiven you. Or even the Apostle Paul himself, who by inspiration penned the book of Romans, as we read about him becoming a Christian in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, the preacher came and told him, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Please reflect on this for a moment. Have you ever obeyed the gospel? Have you ever obeyed the gospel? Or were you told to say the sinner's prayer to be saved? Is that what you were taught? And so that's what you did because that's what you were told. Now I want you to appreciate there is a form to the sinner's prayer. You bow your head, you raise your arm. There's a form to it. But that is not the form of the gospel, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's not praying involved in that. What we are told is to believe this gospel, repent, and be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Have you obeyed the gospel? It's the form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Have you obeyed the gospel? Or were you christened as an infant? Your parents took that and took care of all of that because your parents are doing the best they knew to do, and that's what parents do. They do the best they know to do. But you know, a baby doesn't believe from the heart, and a baby doesn't repent of anything. And sprinkling water on someone's head sure isn't the same as an immersion, a burial, and coming up out of it. You need to obey the gospel for yourself. You need to model the death, burial, resurrection of Christ in baptism. You need to repent and believe from the heart. You need to obey the gospel to be saved. 
Have you obeyed the gospel? Well, what about people who have been baptized? What about people who are Christians? There's an awful lot in the room this morning. Do they still need to obey the gospel? What about that? Are we done with the gospel when we're baptized? And I'll tell you this morning, no. You're not done with the gospel, and the gospel is not done with you when you are baptized. And so I want to go to number three. How does a Christian obey the gospel? How does a Christian obey the gospel? You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, in verses 1 and 2, he's talking to folks who were all baptized. We learned that in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. We learned that in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. They'd all been baptized. But he says to him, moreover, brethren, I declare to you, I think I have that one. I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. See, a Christian's supposed to hold it fast. Unless you believed in vain. Unless it was futile and for naught. It's kind of like we're taught we're supposed to obey our parents. Does that mean you obey your father in one particular uh, aspect on one particular day? And then you've never worried about your father ever since. Or it's kind of like how we're taught to obey the law of the land. Right? Is it just one item of all the law of the land and then, you know, wild west after that? You make your own law to yourself? No. We learn the ways of our parents and we continually obey them to honor God and please him. We learn the laws of the land and we obey them that we might honor God and please him. That's what it is about obeying. And I would have us understand the same thing about obedience to the gospel. Obedience is ongoing. And it is remarkable how often Christianity is portrayed in New Testament terms, again, of death, burial, and resurrection. This is the way we live in obedience to the gospel. Once we've been baptized, here is our new life. It is a new life of daily death to self. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This obeying of the gospel is a life of daily sacrifice. I need to put to death myself in this spiritual way that I might be faithful to Christ, that I might have some of what the apostle Paul wrote about in Galatians 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, not literally, but he had obeyed the form of the doctrine. So he'd been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or 1 John 3, verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? What a question. But I hope that you are seeing that what we are doing is dying to self and selfishness to be alive to the Lord, to be alive to our brethren. It is in terms of death. We're also taught about this new life in Christ in terms of burial. To bury an old man of sin and keep him buried. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. That when we are obeying the gospel initially and we're being baptized, there is a spiritual action going on. That's God's part as he is washing away our sins and removing a body of death. And an old man is buried there and left there, that old man of sin. But some of us may know and can speak to That old man has a way of sticking his head up every once in a while. We're taught again and again in the New Testament to bury that old man and leave him buried. In Ephesians 4, verse 22, in fact, I'm going to read just a little bit more of this. If you want to turn your Bible to Ephesians 4, then what I could fit on the chart. Ephesians 4, verse 17. Ephesians 4, verse 17. 
This I say, therefore, and I testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We are not about continuing in sin or looking for ways to sin. We cannot serve sin anymore. We are to repent of sin and offer ourselves to God as servants to perform righteousness. And it's important that we understand this about obeying the gospel. I had a really good, he's still alive. I have a really good friend, preacher of the gospel, a little older than myself. But I remember many years ago, he was preaching in a small congregation And uh, as uh, preachers are wont to do, wandering around the auditorium and straightening songbooks. And that's been a number of years ago. Because in his good work of straightening songbooks, he found this little cache of all the notes that the young people had been writing and passing back and forth in that pew. And apparently in a great hurry, they had shoved them into some songbooks or something. but, But here they were. And he read them. And don't ever do that. He really got an insight into what all that group of young people was thinking. And they didn't think much of him. They mocked him in many ways and mocked many of his sermons. It was all written down in there. But the thing that really, really hurt him and scared him was the statement, what does this guy think? How is baptism going to keep me from fornicating? They didn't use the word fornicating. They were very vulgar. And you reflect upon that. It seems to me that there were some young people in that church and at that time who had heard the message, I'm supposed to be baptized. I need to get down in the water and come up out of the water. I need to be baptized. They did not understand I obey the gospel. They didn't understand that. Because baptism is the beginning of a new life, a life of death and burial and resurrection. And we don't look at that as some marker to say, well, I did that. I'm good. Now I'm going to go live my own way because that is a life of rebellion to God's teaching and the morals he prescribes us in his word. I want us to be clear this morning. I'm talking to you about obeying the gospel. And it begins with baptism. It begins with baptism. This life is characterized in death to self, burial of an old man of sin. In fact, if you want to be immersed, immerse yourself in prayer, child of God. Immerse yourself in the word of God, in the Bible, child of God. Immerse yourself in that. A new life. Death, burial, and resurrection raised up. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6, God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Sins are forgiven. We're raised up. It's new life. It's spiritual life. It's rebirth. It's incredible. And this is the life we pursue. And he says, your life has changed. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10, because you have been raised anew and you have been raised to serve. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It doesn't just follow that because we have died to self and we bury an old man of sin, that this new life must be directed and prescribed by God. And we want to serve him and we want to do those things because we are living for him. Raised up. What are we called in Romans 12 verse 1? We're called a living sacrifice. Because we are alive. Because we are living. And how is this accomplished? By the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
obeying the gospel, where we are granted a new spiritual life, and a new spiritual life means a new way of thinking and a new way of behaving. If I could bring one scripture reading to you in the lesson of yours, I'm going to take that reading from Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1. Colossians 3 and verse number 1. And see if you notice yourself some of our key phrases about death, about new life. Colossians 3 and about being raised up. Colossians 3 and verse 1. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. You were sons of disobedience. Now we're obedient, right? Now we're obedient to the gospel. And verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. He was renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. We hold fast the gospel. That's what the apostle wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. We obey the gospel. And so as Christians, our lives are shaped by the gospel. Our lives become displays of the gospel to the world around us, and our lives invite others to obey the gospel as well. Obey the gospel. I appreciate your good attention. If you want to put your notes away and put your Bible away. And I hope you will search out your heart. In light of the word that you have heard this morning, that you have read yourself, that you've perhaps read in your own Bible, are you a Christian like we read about in this Bible? If you're not a Christian, then you need to obey the gospel. Obey the form of teaching from the heart. Repent of your sins and be immersed, be baptized into Christ and come up out of that water in new life. And I want you to know this morning, if you're ready to obey the gospel, we have a baptistry here. It's behind this screen. And we have clothing here. And there is no reason that you should leave this place and not obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. But for those of you here who said, yes, I was baptized. I was baptized some time ago. I'm a Christian. Well, how are you doing at holding fast and obeying the gospel? How are you in the daily denial of self for Christ, for the brethren? Would you say that the old man is buried and you are now immersing yourself in prayer or the word of God? Is it a new life in a renewed mind or old sins causing you to backslide and return to the world? How can we help you this morning to obey the gospel? Can we pray for you? Can we encourage you? Can we baptize you into Jesus? Whatever your need is, we're going to sing a song right now. Brother Stephen's going to come and lead it. You don't need to sing it. You need to come forward and obey the gospel. Please come forward now. As together we stand and sing.